Well, we wanted to start the conversation uh, with you, Senator. There's been so much talk about how the women in the Senate get along, bipartisan, have dinners. How well do you know the women the, these, you know, in the other chamber that are sitting with you? Well, we are really good friends, and I think when people talk about the days of old and they miss how people used to work together, that's what we've got going with the 20 women senators. Our numbers help. Uh, for a while, we were 16, and that was unfortunate because they call us the sweet 16. Uh, <laughs> now we are up to 20, and as I uh, pointed out in a tweet, we made United States history when there was finally a traffic jam in the United States Senator women's bathroom. <laughs> this was a, a great achievement for all of us. Um, and I think it probably came to light the most just recently with the shutdown, where we had um, uh, half of the women in the group of 14 uh, that actually pushed the leadership on a deal uh, a framework uh, to resolve that were women. And Susan Collins started the group, and uh, it was uh, half Republicans, including uh, Kelly Ayotte and Lisa Murkowski, and then uh, Jean Shaheen and, um, uh, and myself and Senator Heikamp. And we worked together and uh, helped to lead that group, and it made a big difference. So I think those friendships and that trust that we have uh, is genuine. We get together for dinner every other month. The last event was at my house. We had a pot Minnesota potluck dinner. <laughs> what was the hot dish, sir? Well, it was chicken, of course. Come on, chicken. I'm from North Dakota. The one before that, well, the one before that was Senator Murkowski, and her husband actually uh, fished the salmon and fr froze it and sent it to so her. Great. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We allow the men to be hunter-gatherers. <laughs> great. I guess... Um, I'd like to ask all three congresswomen here, have you seen sort of this, this, level, this, this spirit that the, the senator is talking about, we haven't heard about it translating to the House as much. Has there been sort of an effort to have it translate to the other chamber, and what kinds of partnerships are being formed? Well, uh, we certainly are having it in the freshman class. I'm a, a new member of the 113th district from the St. Louis area, and we just had a great dinner this week with the freshman members uh, from the Democrat side of the aisle and the Republicans. I won't tell you how many bottles of wine we went through. But, uh, <laughs> and what we talked about was coming together to get things done. Women are born networkers. We're born communicators. We're multitaskers. We're solution-oriented. And um, I think there are lots of opportunities for us to come together and, and make things happen. That's why I came to Congress. I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat discouraged with the, the level of dysfunction, to be perfectly honest. And to the extent that we can be vehicles of change uh, in, uh, in moving the ball forward, advancing things on behalf of uh, our constituents uh, and, uh, and the, the country, that's uh, what we want to be a part of. Well, as an old timer, I've been, I've been here uh, longer than many of you have even been alive. Uh, we used to get along, we used to have these uh, uh, bipartisan uh, uh, women uh, dinners uh, far more often during the years of uh, Marge Rockema, mm -hmm. et cetera. So if they are still going on, maybe I'm not invited anymore. I don't know. Do, but, uh, Do you but remember I, when they stopped but, uh, happening but, as much? No, but I, uh, they, they were every month, and we were at the Monocle, and, and, and they were really very good. Mm -hmm. McCarthy from the Democratic side. They were wonderful dinners, and we got to discuss whatever legislation we're working on, trying to get more co-sponsors for our bills, because we all have our power groups from our own party, but it's hard to get bipartisan support because we're just always meeting as, uh, as political parties. And uh, we have more friendships within our own party. So these get-togethers was really, they were a great opportunity to get to move our legislation along, and, and they were very helpful. So I've got to talk to my scheduler, make sure that I'm on that dance card again. <laughs> it's on my dance card next time. How about you, Congressman? Uh, uh, Congressman, you're the newest of the, everybody sitting up here. I mean, anything surprise you or, you know, your relationships kind of across aisles so far that you've been able to build? Yeah, you know, I think uh, what has been unique about our, our class who was just elected was the recognition in a very uncoordinated way between us that we were here to get things done. We were here to get results. And the only way and the best way to do that was to work together. And what we found after being here for a few months uh, and coming back from town hall meetings and district visits and kind of exchanging stories was that the messages that we were uh, delivering back home were exactly the same, which were that even in spite of the dysfunction, even in spite of the frustration that was there, the hope that we had and the hope that we have for going forward was the fact that we had enough people of like mind who were interested in working together and building those relationships from the very beginning uh, that have allowed us to do that. 
Um, on the more fun side, I got to know Illy uh, during the women's softball game. Yeah. <laughs> Senator yeah. Kelly Ayotte, Amy, uh, you know, was our MC for the game, and uh, you know, I think we have a recruit over here. Well, there we go. <laughs> I was cheering alongside the torn rotator cuff issue. But, uh, I was there. You know, but we learned a lot about each other That's as great. people and our families, and and it was a great time to build camaraderie and um, establish a lot of a lot of friendships that have blossomed into other things. And I know all their RBIs. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Congressman Wagner, maybe we can talk a little bit more seriously. Um, Republicans have had any issues in terms of having the same kind of numbers in Congress. And I know that you have really spent time this year trying to change that and in recruiting. Can you talk a little bit about those efforts? I am pleased to talk about it. It is an absolute passion of mine. There are 19 Republican women in, con in Congress. Um, we have a conference of 232. Uh, it, it's a failure, and, and one that absolutely must be addressed. Um, I, I look out, I see Susan Molinari, and I see, uh, I, I see Barbara Comstock, and others that I've worked with over the years on a program called Winning Women, which got women involved across the country in, in politics. Uh, and we're doing this now, and I'm heavily involved in Project Grow that the NRCC is involved in. It has a messaging component, reaching out to women, talking to that 37-year-old single mother of two who's trying to make it to the 15th and the 30th of the month. But the recruitment piece of it, I have to tell you, is fantastic. And of the, of the 40 to 50, I'll say, key competitive races that we're looking at uh, at the committee right now, over half of them, we have fielded a woman candidate. And uh, they, a lot of them have primaries, but we're working with them and doing what I would call real recruitment. Not just mentoring of women that are going to enter uh, the, the, the race, but going out and finding uh, that, that teacher, that military vet, that small business owner, that mayor, that community leader who's willing to step up uh, and be a part of our process here. So uh, we're working very hard uh, on this. And as I said, along with many of my colleagues and members, it's a true passion of mine. I hope that we can up those numbers uh, in the next Congress. Um, just a follow up to that. The outreach, there's been a lot of talk since the last election about Republican outreach to women and how it's gone. And you mentioned it just now. But I'm wondering if you can go into a little more depth about what you hear back, what kind of feedback there is. Well, I get so aggravated. You know, we're, women, you all, we're not a coalition. We are 54% of the electorate. We rule, okay, truly, the hashtag is right. Women rule, and uh, we decide the elections going forward, and we decide a lot of things. We're the ones that are balancing the family uh, and our personal budgets. We're the ones making most of the spending decisions. We are on the front lines of health care. You talk to any Medicare provider, they will tell you they're speaking to a daughter or a daughter-in-law. We're involved in energy policy. We're the ones putting the gas in the car. We know what it means. So. Uh, you know, it is time that we step up. We're all involved in this to change public policy. We don't do that unless we're in power. We're not in power unless we win elections, unless we step up and involve ourselves. I am tired of, of uh, others, and there are politicians across this country that are making a decision on your behalf every single day. You know, be involved uh, as, as a voter, as a participant, uh, as an activist, but also mm -hmm. as someone that's willing to run for office. Um, if I could actually just follow up along the panel, um, just to get the sense, especially given the partisan divide and I, the gridlock, and I assume you all hear complaints about this from your constituents, but what is the, the number one issue that he, you hear from women constituents that you would like to be dealt with differently, that they would like to be dealt with differently in Congress? You know, they're all interested in, in, in jobs and, and security and the next generation. You know, um, I don't believe in women's issues. I believe that there are, are issues, and many, and they're broad, that women have a great interest in and are um, uh, involved in at all level, levels. And it has to do with jobs, the economy, safety, security, the future of our, uh, of our families and uh, our, our nation. They want to make their lives a little bit easier. I mean, let's face it. There are women across America that are just trying to, to, to you know, make those tennis shoes last another six months longer than they have to. We've got to make their lives easier, better, um, and more functioning. So. Yeah. Well, I represent a district where the majority of the folks are, are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Either they were born outside of the United States or they classify themselves as, as Hispanic uh, Americans on the census forms. And for them, even if they have their immigration status uh, 
approved and they don't have to worry about it. In my district, immigration reform uh, remains mm -hmm. a priority. And so there's a great sense of, of frustration that the Senate has already acted, the House has yet to act. We hope that we'll, we'll pass with Speaker Boehner's leadership piecemeal uh, legislation to get us through uh, that, uh, to solve the, the legality of, uh, of the immigrants and get them on a path to citizenship. But uh, we have to first secure the borders, and that's what I hear a lot from our constituents. Let's get immigration reform done. That's a priority. But first, make sure that we're not going to repeat this mistake and, and, and this remedy uh, 10 years from now. So that immigration and also jobs, they're very much tied together in my district in South Florida. So uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had a big... Uh, boom in the financially a few years ago. Now construction is uh, all time low. Tourism is still the driving force in, in South Florida, but the construction jobs seem to not be coming back. And we're getting a lot of money coming in from Venezuela and other places that are unstable, but we don't know how long that bubble will last. So there's a, a sense of insecurity about the economy in South Florida. And I think those two issues are what's, what's driving the, the voters. And the third thing that unites them is disgust at Congress. Right. Uh, we're glad to be that unifying force. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know where that 6% that it still approves of us are. They're not in South Florida. They're over in your area. And can I just follow up really quickly, and we'll kind of come back Please. to the panel, but we, uh, immigration reform is obviously something that we've all focused a lot on this Congress. You've been one of the key players in the House. Uh, talk about your role. I mean, do you feel like your role as a, as a woman or as a peacemaker in terms of trying to get agreement and kind of work across party lines, which is something we haven't seen a lot of? Well, we, we do have bipartisan leaders who are uh, leading the charge. We have Paul Ryan, we've got Mario diaz Ballard, and, and we've got working with folks like uh, Zoe Lofgren and, and, and Luis Gutierrez. So there is a lot of bipartisan uh, movement uh, on the immigration issue. I, I think that the press sometimes looks at all the negative parts that we're not moving along, but there are a lot of uh, uh, conversations uh, uh, and, and the sidelines moving moving the the force along. So I'm optimistic that we can get it done. Uh, I know that we're hitting a lot of bumps along the road, but it's going to be it's going to be all right. I'm optimistic about that. And just to follow up on what Anna said, actually, and then and then return. But um, is there an example in these negotiations where you can point to something that you've handled differently than your male colleagues? Has it um, has your perspective uh, as a female member of Congress either informed you at all in terms of how you have approached this and? Well, I think more than, more than my gender, probably just my background, because I came to the United States when I was eight. I'm a, right. a refugee myself. So I think that folks who have dealt with refugees and immigrant families um, see how much it impacts women. Because so often, many times, uh, the male is not there. Either he's been deported or the dad is not present. And immigration is really a, a woman issue. It's a, it's a family-centered issue. And I think that we need to focus it more that way and, and look at it more about how it impacts domestic violence also because if you're, if you're an immigrant who's, who does not have papers, uh, you're less likely uh, to tell the, the, the police uh, or, or any law enforcement official that you're being abused or that your employer is not paying you correctly. So domestic violence, human trafficking, all of these issues are, are uh, tied to immigration and definitely women are... are gravely impacted by the lack of, of immigration reform. So it really is, not that there are women issues, I agree with Anne, there, there are no women issues, but this issue of uh, immigration directly impacts women and it's usually the mom and, and the kids. Okay. If we could just go back to the Senator and to Congresswoman Gabbard, just about what you're hearing from your districts, particularly women, women voters in your districts. Well, I think a lot of what uh, the Congresswomen have been saying, uh, first of all, the economy is what they care about the most. And in maybe a little different way, in my state, the unemployment rate is now down to 4.8%. Wow. There wow. you go. Wow. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of thriving businesses that we're very proud of. We have a strong rural economy, and we've been able to do it, I think, because we have a well-educated workforce and we focus a lot on exports. Uh, and 
so the issues for a lot of our constituents are about how much things cost. Uh, the concern about the cost of gas down a little bit right now, the concern about the cost of college, uh, concern about the cost of health care. Uh, those kinds of issues are what they're really focused on right now. I'd say the second thing uh, is what Ileana mentioned about uh, a unity on wanting Congress to work better together. Um, the, uh, they're just very angry about this gridlock because they know if we're out of the downturn, things have kind of stabilized, and there's things we should be doing, like immigration reform. And I so appreciate your work on that. And I'm on the Judiciary Committee and have worked um, uh, with Senator Hatch on a lot of the provisions on the business side of that issue. And we're really uh, proud of that Senate immigration bill and want to get it done. Does uh, they it think frustrate you to be the do-nothing Congress? I mean, that's well, like what it's going to be. <laughs> I, um, I actually, on the Senate side, I'll, I, um, there are some major things we've gotten done there. Right. Um, and maybe part of it is that nearly half of our leaders, chairman in the uh, Senate, are women. <laughs> um, but we have moved ahead on a lot of bills, and um, I think that the shutdown really brought everything to light for the, for the people in the country, that this is ridiculous. They're actually uh, holding us back uh, instead of allowing us to move forward as a country. And so that's what I hear the most uh, from the people in, in the state. And I think that uh, what I love about the women up here, when I think about Tulsi with her military background and the work Ileana is doing on immigration reform, uh, the work that Anne's done internationally as an ambassador, I uh, you can't ask people, are you a Democrat or Republican, when they come and they, they need help or you're standing on the right. front line next to them. You just have to work with them together. And I think when you look at the backgrounds of the women in Congress, a lot of them have come from those kinds of results-oriented fields. I was a prosecutor. That was my job. I couldn't ask any victim what their political affiliation was. I just had to go and get the thing done. And I think that has helped us uh, to work together and get some of these things done. But we are ready to move on immigration reform. Patty Murray's leading the way on the budget working with Congressman Ryan, and I'm just hoping we're going to see a new day uh, in the next few months. Yeah, you know, I mean, regardless of from Hawaii to Florida and everywhere in between, uh, the issues that people are concerned about are the same, uh, whether it is the economy or jobs or making sure we're providing good education to our kids and making sure that we have a strong and sustainable future. But the underlying, I think, common thread also throughout all of that uh, from women, from constituents as a whole is not understanding why we're not getting things done. Uh, finding it somewhat inconceivable when there is so much commonality between the issues that we're hearing from at home, when there is so much commonality and the things that we'd like to tackle collectively, regardless of party, why aren't we able to, to actually sit down and, and work out the differences? And what Ileana said is true, is there's, there's a lot of great work that's happening that doesn't make the headlines. There are a lot of small groups of members meeting talking about Democrats and Republicans, not, not those classified as moderates, but actually people who represent a broad spectrum of views on policies and politics and how to, how to find solutions, and saying, how do we figure out this budget deficit issue? How do we deal with the debt ceiling and figuring out that, that common ground that's there? So I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do, those of us in the rank and file in Congress, is, is creating these partnerships, coming up with substantive solutions, and creating the pressure from within to be able to try to bring some of these initiatives to the floor and actually get some movement. What's been the biggest surprise for you, I mean, in terms of being the rank and file? You're talking about the kind of the meetings, I mean, you're from Hawaii, you come to D.C., the Beltway, kind of, you know, you're into big things like these. You know, has there been anything that's really kind of shocked you or you weren't prepared for? Uh, I, I had the opportunity to work for uh, one of Hawaii's great, Senator Akaka, uh, here as when he was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I worked for him between my two deployments to the Middle East, and you know our two senators from Hawaii were great leaders in many ways, but uh, set a good example and, and um, taught me a lot about building relationships and building relationships that are based on respect and that withstand kind of the partisan winds blowing one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Inouye and Senator Stevens from Alaska were great examples of, of two best friends. They called each other brother. Uh, I laughed one day. They were, they were talking about an issue on the House floor, and after they were done, they went up and tried to fist pump each other and missed, <laughs> missed the first time and they ended up getting it on the second or third try. But, you know, regardless of what happened, they were able to disagree and still remain friends. Um, you know, I was surprised when I first came here, there were a few people and I was reaching out to some of my Republican friends 
And, and I was kind of criticized. I said, you're not supposed to talk to them. What are you doing? It's like, are you kidding me? This is, this is what we need the most. Right. Um, to, to Senator Klobuchar, um, what are the, the hopes for eventually having uh, a woman leading the Senate? Uh, how long do you think it will be until that happens? And would it make it run more smoothly than it has? Um, I, I think most of us believe that the more women we have in leadership, the better off we are. Um, and I think there's proof of that with uh, Debbie Stabenow close to reaching an agreement on the farm bill now that has eluded us uh, for years uh, with Barbara Boxer uh, working with, you know, so, somewhat uh, surprising here, Vitter, uh, to get the word of bill done, and before that, <laughs> Senator Inhofe to get the transportation bill done. Uh, we have um, Susan Collins uh, leading the way on postal reform. A number of us worked together on the Violence Against Women Act that uh, passed the House that was uh, the Senate bill, and we've worked very hard to develop leaders in the Senate, so I don't know exactly uh, the timing. Uh, there's kind of a lineup, uh, as there is in the Senate, uh, but I think that uh, there are women right now in very important leadership roles, and uh, that is including uh, uh, Barbara Mikulski, who's our uh, de facto leader of the women in the mm -hmm. Senate, and one of my best moments was when she gathered the women of the Senate together before a, a vote, and she stood up, as you know, she's quite short, on a couch, <laughs> and looked at us and I felt like I'm back in the 1970s and she says, get out there, square your shoulders, suit up, put your lipstick on and get ready for the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, it is a, uh, it's, uh, there is a lot of experience of the women in the Senate mm -hmm. that is passed on and we really do stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. That's great. Well, why don't we, we want to close with a question to all of you. And a lot of this series has been about kind of women empowerment and being solution oriented. So can you maybe give our audience, you know, a tangible example or a piece of advice about how to become their own peacemakers, you know, whether they're in political office like you guys or they're in the corporate boardroom, some kind of, you know, kind of message to take into their own, you know, as they leave this event today. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've come across is I've, I've both talked to other uh, women who are thinking about getting involved in one way or another, whether in elected office or in other positions, and often I'm met with the response of saying, well, I don't know if I'm qualified. And I think that as each of us looks into our own lives, uh, there is so much uniquely qualifying about experiences that we've gone through, ways that we may not have recognized where we actually have had experience leading a group of people are leading an effort, and I think that um, our voices need to be heard more, and recognizing and valuing the experience uniquely that we bring to the table, whatever that is, uh, is important for us to recognize and then to be able to convey to others. Yeah, and it, my advice is really along those lines of uh, sort of the lean in for women that want to go into politics, that you have to lean in, and I would I'd put the nuance on it that you shouldn't be afraid of the negativity, uh, that it is part of the game right now, and you have to have these intense debates, and you're going to have to be attacked on commercials and TVs and things like that. It's going to happen, but if you don't get involved, you're not going to be able to change it. Um, and I've always thought one of the best ways to change it is if people of opposite parties uh, that may stand in the opposite boxing ring of so many things, that they're willing to say, you know what, courage is not doing that anymore. Courage is whether you're willing to stand next to someone you don't always agree with for the betterment of our country. And for people to be willing to go on together on TV to do those things is going to change things because um, not everything is negative. And the only way you're going to change the nuances of it is by doing it yourself. Well, for me, balance. In, in my 30 years of elective office, I'm still trying to find that balance between my professional life, my, my family life, and, uh, and finding some, some me time as well. And I, I'm, I'm still juggling. We still feel like whether you're a teller in a bank or whether you're a, you know, a barista or a member of Congress or a member of the Senate, we're still, we have our professional lives, we have our personal lives, and we never, we never get it right. But uh, but keep juggling, and, uh, and you'll find that, that balance that fits you. And it may not be the textbook uh, definition of balance, but if it works for you and it works for your family, then that's, that's a great thing. And never forget that family is, uh, is the number one above everything else that you've got going on, your relationship with God and, and, and your family. And taking the balance uh, analogy here, I will tell you what women juggle is an egg a bowling ball and a chainsaw, and then the cell phone rings, okay? That is what our lives are, and I don't care what, what you're doing or who you are. To me, what I say to women, um, 
all women, uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, independent, libertarian, whatever you are, say yes. Step out of your comfort zone. Every one of you are qualified and able to step into that arena and run uh, for public office. And we need you. We need your voice. We need your leadership. We need your common sense. Uh, you know, women, as I said, mul multitaskers, communicators, bring people together. Um, we listen. We're the ones who ask for directions when we're lost, right? <laughs> That's us. And, um, and I just uh, encourage all women to get involved in, in so many ways. You're involved in your communities, in your careers. Um, it, it is, you, you, can have, you can have it all, not all at once. I have three great kids. I have drugged them across the country. I have drugged them across the world. And, uh, and, and here to Washington, D.C. And people will say to me, you're a great role model to your daughter. And I say, I'm a better role model to my sons. Mm. And uh, that they see strong women that are willing to, to stand up and say, okay, you know, I'll put the flak jacket on. I'll take it because I'm going to do what's right for them, for their future, for my constituents. Um, and, and it's just a joy. And, and, and the kind of relationship building that we're able to do uh, as a team um, is important. Walking across that aisle, getting things done. I've seen it in financial services committee. I've seen it in many different ways. Um, so I'll leave you all with just say yes. Step out of the comfort zone. Thank you so much to our panelists for such an engaging Thank conversation. You. Thank you.